Welcome back to Shifted Ed, a um, podcast for, for educators here in Quebec or, and the world. Um, I'm really happy today to welcome Eric Rosenbaum from um, the Scratch uh, team at, at present. Uh, so uh, welcome, Eric. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, hopping on here for a, a conversation. I mean, the topics we'll talk about are are, are pretty right in our faces right now, and um I'm glad that we have some uh, your thoughts towards it. So why don't we start out just by maybe giving us a little background about yourself, um, where you started and and where you are now. Absolutely. My job is awesome as director of Scratch Lab. I get to invent new creative possibilities for creative coding for kids. And like, how do you end up there? I was thinking about some different threads from when I was a kid through young adulthood. One is... I loved, um, you know, playing board games and computer games and other games with my friends, but especially loved inventing them, which many people do. But I just have vivid memories of uh, dumping out board game parts and remixing them to make a new game or um, uh, running around tossing stuffed animals at each other and changing the rules as we invented those kinds of outdoor games, um, obstacle courses for little siblings and um, uh, other invented sports, but especially Mm -hmm. spending a lot of time uh, making up elaborate games for uh, rules for for games you played with dice and maps and character sheets and stuff, making up our own role playing games. Anyway, that is one, one thread. Another one for me is, is, uh, is music. I, I I played the trombone as a kid and as a small Mm -hmm. quiet child, there's a chance to be loud and then (laughs) later learned about, jazz and especially improvisation and composing and those things felt very empowering to me in a way that other parts of school were not so i was lucky to have that within school and have carried that throughout life and and now now do a lot of creative music technology stuff as well um and i did learn to code just a little bit as a kid in basic and in logo but then didn't really return to it until late in college And didn't really connect with it creatively until one day doing like science in a lab with a tool called MATLAB, a programming language. I realized I could Mm -hmm. also use that to generate weird sounds. And that sent me on Mm -hmm. an interesting path that I still follow (laughs) today, using computers to make music and play around with sound. Um, Mm -hmm. And then the last thread is, is electronics, which of course I do some of as well. I was definitely a take apart your old Walkman or CD player or whatever kid but i it was hard to put it back together <laughs> uh, and but it was i guess in college i started doing something called circuit bending which is the there's a whole art of taking apart noise making toys electronic toys and modifying them mm-hmm. so that you can distort the sounds in crazy ways i got deep into wow. that which was so fun and that yeah. also led me to programmable electronics and i was just fortunate to be in the area where um, the lifelong kindergarten group at MIT Media Lab was doing research on creative electronics and robotics for kids. This was in 2001, 2002. Mm-hmm. And got involved with that, helping to teach workshops at MIT Museum. And that set me on a, on a path that I'm still on today of right. learning about constructionism and creative learning tools through the work of Mitch Resnick at uh, Media Lab. Amazing. What a trajectory. Um, I love the idea too of, of the music part. And I mean, I guess Scratch has that amazing element too of music production or music creation um, that's embedded within it. It does. And I've played around with and thought about and contributed to that a lot. Um, you, If you're a Scratch enthusiast, you know that there are blocks that can play sounds. You can record sounds. We have a library of sounds. Um, but you may also know, if you really know the details, that in Scratch 3, we introduced, and this was my idea, a block that can change the pitch of sounds. What it really does is just yes. speed them up and slow them down, but that also changes right. the pitch. But it, it gives you a, a a really fun kind of expressive control over, over the sounds. You can make it all squeaky and high and, and really <laughs> deep and strange. And one really reliable <laughs> phenomenon we find in playtesting with children is that one, they love to hear their own voice. So recording yes. and playing back your own voice is very powerful. And two, it's hilarious to speed it up or slow it down. 
those are very mm-hmm. reliable things over decades, I think. Um, so I was glad to be able to add that block to scratch the pitch mm-hmm. effect. Um, and of course, it's we a great the- block too. Eh? I mean, oh, thanks. <laughs> it's it's similar to your your mindset at, at, at MIT, the lifelong kindergarten of low entry points. But I mean, what you can do with it once you start experimenting, even just with a single block, is is remarkable. And it doesn't have to be complicated, but you keep pushing that ceiling higher and higher and higher the more you play with it. Yeah, I love that. And we we talk about this this house metaphor from from Mitch Resnick, the the low floor, easy entry point, the high ceiling, you can get really far with complexity and the wide walls. Also, you can take it lots of different directions and pursue different interests. Mm-hmm. And I think that the the pitch effect block is a pretty good example of that because it is mm-hmm. pretty simple. It's not as simple as some other things. And so it's not the easiest thing to use. One reason is that it doesn't make the sound by itself. It has a kind of Mm -hmm. side effect on other things. And so it's slightly more abstract than a block like play sound that has this immediate effect of playing the sound. But once you understand the model that it affects the sound that's going to play or even while it's playing, then you can really do some crazy stuff with it. Uh, And and it's true. You can far once you understand also the relationship between the numbers you put into it. Um, yeah. so change the pitch by 10 means, um, uh, like 10 of those steps is one semitone, like the distant difference between C and C sharp. So you can actually make musical effects with it as well. Uh, you wow. can turn any sound into a piano. You can, you know, woof, woof, right. woof, 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 <laughs> blah, 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 blah. You can do that. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. Now, without getting too into the weeds with it, um, is it complicated to create a block in scratch? Like, what's the process of, of creating these new blocks and because they come out fairly often, right? I mean, there were version three point something now. Um, and there always seems to be new additions that come to it. Like what's that process like? I should say, first of all, that at the core of scratch is a little bit, um, conservative. We're very careful about what we add to the language to make sure that we're finding that kind of sweet spot of things that are, that preserve that low floor, especially that they're really understandable and simple, that they're idiomatic, like scratch is a language. And so that everything has to kind of go together and work in a way that feels like coherent and cohesive. Also that like things, don't break each other. It's a complex system of moving parts and you have to have blocks that, that um, any block can be used with any other block. We're very inspired by Lego, which talks about this notion of system, 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 every blocks that were made in the 1980s. And we have some blocks that my, my daughter plays with uh, still work with the brand new Lego blocks because they make sure that everything works all together, even across Duplo and Lego system and Technic. So similar thing with, with Scratch, we make sure that uh, anything new we add works with all the previous features. Right. I've loved tinkering with Scratch by adding blocks and have done that since the beginning, since and I've been around since Scratch was launched in 2007 and had a lot of, lot of fun with that. And it's changed over the years exactly how you do it. Uh, in Scratch 1, you could directly modify the source code of Scratch in a language called Squeak. In Scratch 2, it was based on Flash, so you would write... Um, actually we had a way to write JavaScript to add blocks to it in a thing called ScratchX. Sadly, that's gone. That was super cool, but people around the mm-hmm. world make their own extensions that way. And in Scratch right. 3, it's all JavaScript and it's a little bit more complicated to get started. Um, but in the end, you, you're just writing what's called a function, a little block of JavaScript code that when you mm-hmm. click on that block to run it, <laughs> it's calling that code. It runs it. <laughs> and I, and I, um, I've done many, many experiments of trying to find that creative sweet spot of something that feels really Mm -hmm. simple, but is very generative, meaning it opens up lots of creative possibilities. Absolutely. And I guess that Scratch, its it's mindset is that openness that anything's possible. Um, And even when I, in, in classes with students and we're playing with Scratch, I mean, I'm always learning something new from their thought processes and their creations. Like it's, it's, it almost seems infinite at times. Yeah, uh, I think we, we like to think so, that Scratch opens up this incredible space of creative possibilities. So I've collaborated for many years with, with Jay Silver, who was a graduate student at the same time with me in the Life and Kindergarten group where Scratch was being created. And he would talk about um, the 
the starter projects. So earlier versions of Scratch, when you downloaded it, it would come with a set of projects to show you the possibilities. And he would talk about the sample project space and make a kind of map of these. And I love this idea that hmm. the examples that you give um, create a space of possibilities in a person's mind. And as a result of that, the further apart the examples are, so if you mm -hmm. can have, if, so if, if you, if you were showing, if you were making a tool like scratch and you made a bunch of examples, they were all about like doing arithmetic with it or something, then right. regardless of how powerful the tool itself is, if people open it up and see those examples, they think that that's what it's for. And so we really mm -hmm. tried from the very beginning with scratch to make examples about, uh, you know, breakdancing and platformer games and uh, dressing up in clothes of some historical period and making a book report about Easter Island, like um, trying to, to push that map outward as far as possible, right. because then if people can see like, oh, the, these points in the space are really far apart, there must be a lot in between and maybe even right. things outside of it, then that helps their imagination stretch. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, talking about um, your collaborations with your, your, as you started lifelong kindergarten, you had this amazing, um, product that came out of that, um, with Jay that you guys had created. You want to talk a little bit about how the idea of the makey makey came to be? Yeah. Um, not everyone understood at first when we were saying, we have this idea, we're going to connect bananas to computers. Not everybody knew what we were talking about. Um, if you don't know, Makey Makey is a little circuit board that Jay and I invented uh, about 10 years ago, actually more than that, um, that you connect to the computer. The computer thinks it's a mouse and keyboard, but you make your own keys out of everyday objects. And then you trigger those keys by completing a circuit. And we made it very sensitive so that you could complete the circuit just by touching anything, even a little bit electrically conductive, like a flower or a gummy bear, a piece of aluminum foil, a penny, or yeah, a banana. Um, and then because it just pretends to press uh, a key on the keyboard, you can use it with any software on your computer that responds to those key presses. And so right. the canonical example being, you can easily find many different pieces of software that play a musical note when you press, you know, A, S, D, F, or um, the arrow keys or whatever, the space bar on your computer. And so you can make a row of objects like bananas and turn those into a, into a, a piano. Where did that come right. from? With Scratch, we were already connecting the digital to the physical worlds in flexible mm -hmm. ways. And there was a device at the time called the Scratch sensor board, no longer exists. Yep. It had many interesting, <laughs> yeah, it had many interesting features, including mm -hmm. distance sensors. So these it had little alligator clips you could clip on to different objects and it would measure how resistive they that was. And that's fun and interesting for experiments. But one thing that that Jay understood was that the dynamic range, the possibilities for how much resistance there is, especially when it comes to human skin and food and stuff, was even right. larger. So we wanted to push that boundary. And then measuring resistance values inside Scratch is fun and interesting. You can do a lot with that. But at some point, we had this creative leap where it's like, what if instead of measuring that as a number, we just turned it into a switch so that you could press mm -hmm. keys and then use it with anything? You could use it with Scratch, and it works beautifully with Scratch, but you could use it with any game that you're playing or music application or photo booth or word processor, or web browser, anything you're using, you could connect mm -hmm. with the Makey Makey. And so it has this kind of open-endedness in both ways in the software, like I was just saying, but also in the physical world, it works with a huge range of different kinds of objects and materials. And so the inventions that people have made with it are uh, very wide ranging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you ever want to go watch some cool videos, just type Makey Makey into YouTube and it's unbelievable the creativity that's come out of it. What, Eric, was that aha moment where, do you remember that moment where it was like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> like, <laughs> What if? Well, was, I, yeah, there were a couple of um, times that Jay were on either a road trip through California or I guess the time we remember telling our advisor, Mitch Resnick, about it was on a train ride through Europe. But anyway, because, you know, we'd travel around to conferences. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, I don't know that there was a single aha moment, but just these creative conversations that Jay and I would have 
about it. And then another crucial moment was one summer I in it was 2010, I think, I went to the San Francisco Exploratorium, this incredible science museum. They have a group there called the Tinkering Studio that mm -hmm. uh, Left from Kindergarten has worked with over many years, a very creative people that design hands-on, playful, um, good learning experiences. And I, with those folks, built the first kludgy little electronic devices long before the name Makey Makey existed. And right away, yeah. those folks saw the potential and um, one person built uh, like drums that you could play by tapping little foil patches on your pants, drum pants. <laughs> Another person <laughs> built a little garden foil flowers that you would blow on and it would make sounds. Uh, that was actually using Scratch. Uh, another person played a version of Dance Dance Revolution making these foam floor pads. So all of that was there from day one, right. the very first prototype um, that that I made there at the Exploratorium. Amazing possibilities. Every time I bring Makey into the class, because I usually pair it with Scratch, because they just they they marry so beautifully together. Peanut butter and jelly. It's not a coincidence. Yeah, absolutely. They're yeah, born absolutely. out of the same impulses. Yeah. <laughs> right. And their eyes just pop out like and I bring it into young classes with like preschool, like four and five year olds. Oh wow. And we play their hands right so they'll hold it's one of the, human the wires <laughs> i love that yeah. and they can't get over it and then they they let go of the cord and then they're like hey chris it's not working anymore and then they start to make these connections between okay there's something going on without getting too much in the detail of it but it's mm -hmm. amazing to see those sparks of of idea and wonder and the possibilities then you just see their minds just like <laughs> running yeah. um what have been what's been the most um successful application of of makey makey that you've experienced or seen in an educational environment depends what you mean by success <laughs> in the most well the most pure sense there's a kind of success through transformation as I see it. I think there's a power in the makey makey as a tool changing what you see as possible to make, like what you can do, how you can transform your world. And I think that in the best case, that also transforms people's sense of who they are and who they can become. And so the purest example of that that I've seen, actually, somebody approached me at a conference and said, look, I want to thank you for the, the makey makey. It changed my life. I never even opened the box. I ordered it on Kickstarter. We launched it on Kickstarter in 2012. And just because it was sitting there and I knew it would be possible with it, I leapfrogged ahead and started. I never thought I could do electronics, but I just started doing it after that. <laughs> and that person wow. was really transformed by it. But I'd love to see that Amazing. in in kids, this moment of of doing electronics that doesn't feel necessarily accessible because it's this otherwise presented as this impenetrable domain of like you know electro electrical engineering knowledge but actually it's just something you can play with and tinker with and learn by messing with and that's what we want to that's what we want to do for people another form of success is that people make with it things that we never imagined possible or use it in ways that we didn't expect that's what we're really aiming for in making these open-ended tools and one area that really flourished from the start once it was out in the public was assistive technology so people using Makey Makey to make controllers, with, especially for people with physical disabilities, so limited range of motion. Uh, and there are, you know, solutions for those people, expensive technologies, but this is provides a kind of DIY, it has its limitations, but a DIY tool for making a specialized controller just for a particular racing game for someone that can only move one hand, one hand side to side, or a controller for an RPG game for someone that can only, you know, tilt their head in certain ways. You could make pads that their forehead might touch. This kind of stuff right. uh, was right. really wonderful to see. That's amazing. I mean, and again, the ceiling just keeps getting higher and higher and higher as more and more people interact with the the device itself. It's uh, um, what is coming down the pipe for Makey Makey. I know that you do a ton of PD, and um, there's so much out there for teachers to get started with. Um, what are some of the things coming down the line for, for Makey Makey? Yeah, I don't know if there's anything I can share publicly, except to say that we are yeah. always <laughs> tinkering and experimenting with um, new ideas to extend Makey Makey itself. Um, mm -hmm. And also 
uh, other products that are in that similar kind of um, inspiration. Um, if you haven't seen Draudio, that's also in the same family. It's an earlier invention by Jay Silver. That's also one of the pieces of inspiration that led to Makey Makey, but it's still fun. It's um, it's a musical pencil so that you similarly complete a circuit with this musical pencil circuit uh, board, and then it it turns the resistance of, say, the line of graphite on paper into a musical note. And so you can make a, a drawing and play the drawing, but you can also do the human synthesizer or play a potted plant or... Uh, other conductive experiments like with water and food and turn those into music with draw audio. Um, I think, I I hope that there will be a long life of, uh, and a growing family of making Makey like products. We'll see what we can do, what we can get right, out there. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that in itself is something that is just going to be around forever. I think, I mean, I yep. do tons of workshops, just we do a whole day workshops on Makey Makey, showing it to teachers and getting the tinker. And I told you that story about the preschool, what well, happens in teachers just as much. Um, mm -hmm. The first time they realize that, Hey, I could record a voice and scratch, touch a piece of paper. And it will say it back to me is to them, you know, it's mind blowing. And then all these opportunities kind of open up from there, which is super exciting, but it's getting that initial excitement going. And we found that then they're more willing to bring it into their classrooms and stuff. Some teachers, they'll just give it to the kids and say, okay, let's play. Um, mm. But I think that the workshops that were created for me, he, um, for teachers are sensational. Uh, we kind of follow the, the path that was set up. Um, so let's just switch really quickly here to, to scratch as we um, kind of wrap up here, Eric. Um, Scratch is, is continuously evolving. There's new blocks, new colors. Um, that you have your lab that where you experiment with all of these. It, are there some new exciting things that you could tell us about what how Scratch might be evolving in in the day of AI and um, the dawn, I guess I should say, of AI um, that Scratch is kind of um, starting to get curious about? We certainly are. The current generation of AI has been amazingly uh, both exciting and thorny to think about and play with. We're not about to release anything publicly um, because of some of these challenges with it related to um, not just the cost of it, but um, the um, challenges due to bias and inappropriate content that you can potentially get. Um, I put out a, a blog post a few weeks ago about AI image generation in Scratch because I had built a prototype just to see what would this be like. So if you're not familiar, there are now AI tools where you can just type in uh, a description of an image that's never existed, like a purple penguin pirate playing ping pong or whatever. Uh, right. It doesn't have to be alliterative. Um, <laughs> and we'll make a picture of that and you can tweak it and and uh, go back and forth and, and make endless images. And so I thought, well, in Scratch, kids make their own games, animations, and stories, either by drawing their own artwork or picking sprites from our library or importing them. But what would it be like if your creative process included this way to just imagine something and have the AI generate it for you as you're coding your, your game or story? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And it turns out, yeah, it's super fun and incredibly expressive. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some unexpected benefits of the kind of conversation with the AI because of its strangeness. It will generate things that you didn't intend or expect, but that can lead to new ideas. So there's this right. conversation with AI in that sense with the image generation. Um, so check out that post if you're interested. Um, Will do. And I'll, I'll attach it to the podcast actually, so everyone could read it. More recently, I'm hoping to do another blog post about this one soon. I've been experimenting with well, what if the AI text generation, like Chat, like Chat GPT, like if you had blocks in Scratch for playing with that, what would be become possible? And again. We're not going to release this, <laughs> but I just wanted to understand what the future might hold, what the creative possibilities are in spite of all the challenges. And it took messing around with it to even begin understanding what the creative possibilities are. At first, mm -hmm. having done experiments with much earlier, like several years ago, generation of AI, or AI text tools, I thought, oh, that's mm -hmm. going to be kind of weird. It won't be that interesting. Turns out it's like pretty amazing. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> So just pick a sprite. So say I pick um, a crab 
I can tell it, oh, okay, you're a crabby crab, you complain. And then I can make my own chatbot with something like eight or 10 blocks, super simple program. Mm -hmm. But now I can talk to the crab and it's crabby and it's funny and funny. And I can make my own animation <laughs> with the crab when it's talking, or I can talk to a bowl of cheesy puffs. So custom chatbots, that's already super mm -hmm. interesting. But what if then yeah. you have two of them, you can make them talk to each other. You can great, have, great. Um, you know, your cute space dog Sprite and your, and your uh, hardcore space robot Sprite talk to each other and tell their own story. Um, and wh what other possibilities open up? I'm, I'm still yeah. exploring like what you can do and make with this as we play around with it, with the, with the rest of the scratch team. Right. What, what do you find that the most curious thing is about AI that in, in the educational world, like where do you, where do you see it going? Um, in, in, in the positive, I mean, I guess the negative is, is there as all things. Um, but how do you, how do you put more of a rosy color on it? and see the positive benefits that AI could do for, for, for our students. Right. There are definitely risks and harms. Mitch wrote a, a great blog post about, among other things, the, the hazards of people perceiving AI tutors as kind of replacing teachers and the dangers of that. Right. I am trying to understand the creative possibilities of it like how we can use AI as a tool to help kids express their creative ideas and make things in new ways. Um, and also how the use of that tool in itself, the kind of conversation with an AI system as you tinker with it and try to get it to do things that you want is a way to learn about what it is and does. Hmm. Because it is a new kind of entity in our world that is... Right. It feels human-like in some ways because it's trained on our detritus, <laughs> but its intelligence is very uneven in a non-human way. I heard somebody say, it's a little bit like a combination of the stupidest and the smartest human you could imagine. And it extends right. beyond both of those edges too. <laughs> it's a little hard to predict for any given thing. Is it going to be really good or really bad at this? And I think one way to develop a deep understanding of this is to play with it by making things. And so that's one of the reasons I'm working on using it as a creative tool. Amazing. Amazing. I can't wait to see the next couple of years to see, cause I mean, it's growing so quickly this, right. It's and what it came out in last November or something. So it's, it's, it's speed is scary, mm -hmm. but also I love to see the ideas that you can use it to tinker and create with, um, it's pretty amazing. Um, Eric, this has been a real treat. I mean, I just love, uh, picking your brain a bit and kind of getting an idea about, you know, your history, makey, makey, scratch, creative learning, tinkering. Um, it's all been presented here in a beautiful way. So thanks for joining me today. Thanks. I really enjoyed the conversation. That was great. Thanks.